I'm Rachel, a summer student working at the Diamandis Lab. I'm currently an undergraduate at University College London studying neuroscience, an area that investigates the origins and functioning of our body's most complex series of organs, the nervous system. As we saw in episode three, the central question of developmental neuroscience is how this highly organized system arises in a body from a single fertilized egg. With the thousands of different cell types making up the central and peripheral nervous systems, how do developing neurons know what location to form in, where to correctly project their axons and dendrites, and how to interact with other cells? Is it random, or rather, a highly coordinated process? To answer this, we need to look at the instructional code present in every single body cell, the DNA. While all animals have different body plans, so different head, leg, and tail placements, the specific location of those features are decided by a highly conserved subset of genes, called the homeotic genes, a subset of which form something called the Hox code. Each of the Hox genes specify segment identity, whether a segment of the embryo should form part of the head, thorax, or abdomen, and they're all clustered together in the same order as they appear in the body plan within the chromosomes. In this video, we're going to first introduce you to the Hox code and how it operates in Drosophila. Second, we'll explain the genetic mechanism behind it. Third, how it patterns the nervous system in developing humans. And finally, fourth, we'll delve into one study that proves the Hox code in action. Almost every animal has a Hox code, a set of master regulator genes that are expressed in specific regions of the body during development. These genes program how proteins are transcribed in that area which can then trigger a cascade of signaling events that decide the identity of each cell in each body segment. Let's look at how these genes work in a simple organism, Drosophila melanogaster, or the fruit fly, where they were initially discovered. In Drosophila, the set of Hox genes lie in a single series on a single chromosome, and the possession of the genetic material corresponds to the anterior-posterior position of the segments in the body itself. The Drosophila Hox genes form two different complexes. First, antennapedia, which is anterior, and second is bithorax, which is posterior, which are then further subdivided into each segmented body portion that you can see here, with antennapedia having five and bithorax having three subdivisions. Due to the simplicity of this code, single Hox mutations can have startling effects. One of the first documented Hox mutants harbored an antennapedia mutation where another set of legs grows in the place of the antenna. That means that a normal second segment leg development program does take place, but in the wrong location. It shows that that part of the fly is competent to grow nearly every possible structure, but the Hox genes are controlling very specifically which cells produce what. The Hox genes themselves code for a specific set of Hox proteins, which act as transcription factors. Transcription factors can help to determine the expression of other genes within the genome by binding to different places in the DNA to initiate the transcription process. Now, what we see here is two copies of the exact same area in the genome, so the exact same portion of DNA that come from two different cells. And what determines what part of that genome is actually transcribed and will go on to become the protein that causes a signal cascade and eventually constructs an entire body segment is the bonding of the Hox proteins, those transcription factors, onto the DNA at the different locations that they're specified for. So here we see that in the first case, the binding of Hox proteins initiate the transcription of the green areas in the DNA, which themselves code for antenna building proteins. While in the next case, the Hox proteins activate the blue genes, which when transcribed will form the legs. The Hox code in Drosophila is relatively simple as it has a total of eight Hox genes divided between those two complexes, which act in series. However, as evolution developed body plans of higher complexity, 39 Hox genes have emerged in most vertebrates. These are divided into four separate parallel series, each of which look much like the single Drosophila ones, and each occupy their own chromosome in the vertebrate genome. Each Hox gene in the vertebrate can be sorted into one of 13 paralogous groups, meaning groups that share similar terrain in the anterior-posterior axis and have similar function in identifying body segments. Each group contains a pool of up to four genes, labeled A, B, C, or D, 
that need to be combined to completely establish that segment's identity. These groups are especially critical in patterning the developing human nervous system. Now here, you can see the developing embryo, and to the right of it, the developing nervous system, which clearly shows the three distinct areas that have come about in the developing brain. First, the most anterior portion is the prosencephalon, which will go on to become most of the cerebrum. Then centrally, there's the mesencephalon, which will go on to become the midbrain. And finally, most posterior of those three lobes is the rhomboencephalon, which will go on to become the hindbrain and the rhombomeres. Now, remember that there were those 13 paralogous groups, essentially 13 types of Hox gene. And each of those can be attributed to a different area in the developing embryo. So first, from groups one to four, which is going to be the most anterior, the hindbrain arises and is patterned. Second, from groups five to nine, we see the cervical regions of the spinal cord. And finally, the anterior borders of the groups 10 to 13 map onto the lumbar region of the spinal cord. Now, you'll probably notice that there's no Hox coding for the forebrain or midbrain. And indeed, the Hox code only takes effect posterior to the midbrain and what will eventually become the diencephalon, which is an internal midbrain structure. It's thought that the specification occurring in the forebrain is accomplished primarily by morphogens and chemical gradients, rather than the DNA. The hindbrain is densely packed with vital structures. It contains the nuclei and fibers of the cranial nerves, which innervate the muscles of the head and neck, transmit sensory information on hearing, balance, and taste, and control the cardiovascular and gastrointestinal systems. The patterning of the hindbrain is especially important. Distinct neuronal groups within it are the major source of adrenergic neurons from the locus ceruleus and serotonergic neurons from the RAP nucleus, which project up into the upper hemispheres. Because these neurons interact with almost every area of the higher brain, it's critical that they exhibit the same consistent characteristics and obey strict instructions about where to project. During early embryonic development, once the area that will become the hind brain is established, a process of serial segmentation occurs, which divides it into a series of seven to eight lobes called the rhombomeres. These divisions are transient, meaning they appear for a brief window of development before recombining to form new structures. But while they are segmented, there is no mixing of cells between the neighboring lobes. The identity of each lobe is therefore decided by the unique combination of Hox genes that are expressed only in that area. In this diagram, the darkened areas in each of those strips are where the gene is expressed most strongly, so it's contributing most significantly to the segment identity. But as you can see the overlap, it's clear that it's not a single Hox gene that's coding for the segment's area, as it was in the Drosophila, but rather it's a combination of these series of different Hox genes which are forming a much broader and complex Hox code. Now we'll, now, we'll choose one Hox gene to focus on to try and illustrate the importance that it has in contributing to the development of the hindbrain in particular. Hox A2 has a unique feature that makes it a good model to illustrate the importance of each and every one of the 39 Hox genes. A 2008 paper by Geisen and colleagues highlighted the effects of a Hox A2 knockout mouse. But first for background, the pontine neurons, or neurons that derive from the pons in the brainstem, represent a major source of mossy fiber projections to the cerebellum. During mouse hindbrain development, pontine neurons migrate tangentially and sequentially along both the anteroposterior and dorsoventral axes, ultimately ending in the cerebellum. A2 controls the pontine neuron's responsiveness to chemicals that attract and repel them, thus telling them where to go in the brain. However, the researchers found that when the Hox A2 gene was knocked out, the pontine neurons went to the bottom of the brainstem instead of going into the cerebellum. Hox A2 was therefore found to control the expression of certain receptors that are critical in neuronal migration. This last example is a unique case. Typically, all of the paralogous genes meaning all of the genes in a single one of those 13 groups, share overlapping functions, where one or even multiple may be knocked out, 
and a segment can still retain its identity. This case, however, shows that certain Hox genes are essential in development, and altering them can have dramatic effects. Today, you've learned about what Hox genes are and how they instruct the patterning of a new embryo's body segments. You now understand how genetically these master regulators act, and the critical role that they play in the development of the posterior central nervous system. From all of us at NeuroPsych here, thank you for watching.